Mac Power Users, episode 465, The Mighty Mac Mini. Hello, friends. David Sparks here, along with my friend Stephen Hackett. How are you doing today, Stephen? Hey, David. I am good. Very glad to be back, and we're going to get nerdy about some Mac stuff today. Yeah, Mac Mini. Uh, the Apple released a new Mac Mini. We've got a lot to talk about it. What you can do with it. I think a lot of people are wondering, you know, where does this fit in my life or is there a place for it? Well, we're going to cover all of the options today and um, maybe a Mac Mini does fit in your life. But before we do that, a couple preliminary announcements. Don't forget the Seattle meetup for automators and, and frankly, Mac Power users and all the other Relay folks. Um, that we're going to have on January 19th. Uh, there still may be space for that, but it's filling up very quickly. And we'll put a link in the show notes. Also, don't forget, we're doing a live Mac Power Users episode recording in Chicago uh, in early March. And that is another one. We're going to put the link in the show notes, but it's filling up quickly. So please get in there if you're interested. Yeah, we love to see people. I'm I'm so bummed that I'm not going to make it to Seattle. I thought about a last minute trip, but it's, it's not going to pan out. But uh, Chicago is going to be a whole lot of fun. We're excited to take the show on the road and uh, and get out and meet some people. And you know, I've heard there's something in Chicago in the in the early spring called snow. So we'll get to experience that. That'll be fun. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. <laughs> Chicago will fake you out. You know, coming from California, I look out the hotel window in Chicago around this time of year and it's like sunny and it looks nice. And I'm like, oh, great. T-shirt and shorts. Right. And Mm -hmm. then you walk out the door and the wind is coming (laughs) off that lake and I think I'm going to die. Yep. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty exciting. exciting I like Chicago. Um, Yeah, me too. It's a, it's a fun place to go do do work stuff. Before we get started, I would like to thank everybody for such the warm welcome. Our previous episode has been up for a couple of days now when we record this and I've gotten so many gracious and encouraging emails and tweets and messages in the forums. Uh, it's really nice to be welcomed into such a uh, an institution like Mac Power Users. So thank you to everyone who's who's taken the time to write me a note. It really means the world to me. So uh, we're 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 excited to get going. All right. So the Mac Mini got an update. It did. <laughs> it did. What a great feeling. Yeah. For a while, we weren't sure if it was gonna just fade away into the night or or what was gonna happen. But the um, but it got an update. But we thought we so we thought we'd take the Mac Mini on today. But before we kind of talk about the most recent update, I guess there's a little bit of a history lesson involved. There is, and you have me now to <laughs> to talk about Mac history. <laughs> uh, so you told me my initial 12 page draft of this you didn't accept, so I shortened it. <laughs> you know the Mac Mini came around in 2005. It came in at a time where the iPod was just lighting the world on fire. Right, the iPod was a huge hit. And there's something called the halo effect. People would buy an iPod, and the next time they needed a computer, they'd look at, uh, you know, an iBook or a PowerBook or something that, you know, because, hey, it's made by the same people who make my iPod. That works really well. I bet their computers work well. And to capitalize on this, Apple introduced uh, the Mac Mini. It's called the Mac Mini. We think people understood the iPod Mini, and we think they're going to understand the Mac Mini just as well. It's a new member of the Mac family, and this is what it looks like. It's very, very tiny, and it has a combo optical drive, a slot load combo optical drive, so you can not only play DVDs, but you can burn CDs as well inside it. And it's really beautiful. It's got a bunch of cool things to it. It's quiet. It's got the slot load combo drive. It's got Firewire and USB 2, a modem, analog and digital video output, Ethernet, and it's really tiny. So this is a very robust computer, but it's very, very tiny. (laughs) It was what Steve Jobs called BYODKM, which sounds like a NASA abbreviation, but it's uh, bring your own display keyboard and mouse. We supply the computer, you supply the rest. So, you can take Mac Mini, and you can hook it up to, let's say, our 20-inch cinema display, right? And our keyboard and mouse. But the great thing about Mac Mini is you can hook it up to any industry standard display keyboard and mouse. A lot of people already have a display and a USB keyboard and mouse. 
And so that's Mac Mini will hook up to almost any industry standard display, keyboard, or mouse. The idea here was pretty simple, right? You've got a home PC like a Dell or an HP or something, and you want to switch to the Mac. Well, you just buy this little, at the time, $499 Mac, unplug all the stuff from your old PC, plug the same display, keyboard, and mouse right into your Mac, and you were up and running. It was kind of made for switchers, and $499 was the cheapest Mac of all time. I remember that price point really blowing my mind when they announced it, I was like how could a how could a Mac be only 500 bucks of course you could upgrade and spend a lot more right yeah. but starting at 499 was a big deal and so it really was kind of brought into the world as this idea of like you're just going to switch from a PC to the Mac in sort of the lowest friction way possible but it, it very quickly as we'll, as we'll talk about kind of grew past that too yeah, it, we're going to put the link to the announcement in the show notes and the it's 5 minutes of Steve Jobs, you know, where he he waxes poetic on FireWire and uh <laughs> tells you everything that's great about this. But really it was $500 for a Mac. I mean, that was unheard of. Yeah. When I got started in this racket, you know. Um so I I was really happy at the time. I know a lot of people that came to the Mac with that original Mac Mini. Absolutely. It it just opened the door to so many people. And, you know, I don't know how successful it was as a switching machine. I'm sure people did that, but, you know, very quickly Apple sort of realized it was more and they started updating it. It was the, there was another round of like power PC G4 powered Mac minis. That was actually a silent revision. Sometimes you just buy a Mac mini and it was faster than what it said on the box. It was kind of a strange, different time, but then it moved to Intel in February 06 and it came with a core solo chip is the only Mac to ever use this pretty underpowered. And the price was now five ninety nine. but again, Apple trying to keep it in that zone of like, if you want to buy your first Mac, this is a pretty reasonable one to do it. But I think by the time like 2010 rolled around and the body style changed to what we know now, it was six ninety nine, and I think Apple sort of realized that people are buying these for more than just an entry level machine. Yeah, I, I remember the term "core solo," and it felt like it was like a marketing name that performed the opposite, you know, effect of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> core solo, really? It's uh, <laughs> okay. It's it's like uh, half the computer you would get with a real CPU. But uh, <laughs> I do I do think that Apple, um, when they started the Mac Mini, they assumed it was just a switcher Mac, you know, it was going to yeah. bring people over. I don't think they really expected the way all of the already existing Mac users were going to find creative ways to use it, though, because that, I think that started kind of immediately. Yeah, I know. So I, I have a story about this first Mac Mini. I actually have one. It's here in my office. And I worked for like a little nonprofit in high school and... Uh, just like on weekends and stuff and at night. And we bought a G4 Mac mini, this original machine as a file server, because uh, I and the person I worked with both had, la- both had laptops and kind of like shuffling hard drives around just got old. I was like, well, we can just buy a Mac mini and put a big hard drive, you know, dangling off the back via firewire and just put it like literally up on the, up on a shelf somewhere yeah. and not have to worry about storage anymore. And that, that wasn't a switching sort of, situation, right? I didn't replace a PC server. I just bought a Mac mini because it was small and cheap and it did a job that no other computer really could. And I think that to me is the heart of this is that the Mac mini can become many different things depending on what you need it to do. Like I'm sure you remember this too. Early on, there were people who like putting Mac minis in cars, right? With little LCD screens. And now it's silly. You know, people put iPads and, and CarPlay and stuff, but you put like a Mac mini in your glove box to sync iTunes to your car. It's like, I don't think Apple intended that, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, like really the heyday was like around 2011 when Apple released the Mac mini without an optical drive in it. Mm-hmm. And I really kind of embraced the Mac mini as server concept. And I know a lot of people. In fact, I have a friend who runs a law office on one of those quad core Mac minis from 2011 still. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was using one at home until very, very recently. And, you know, getting rid of the optical drive, uh, the price dropped back to five ninety nine, which was nice. But, you know, I think at that point, the optical drive sort of, especially like if you're not using it as a workstation, if you're using it as a server, you're not, you don't need that, right? So you can get rid of it. Uh, they also had some options of like Mac mini server SKUs with like two hard drives and no optical drive. That's several different models over the years. But those 2011, 2012 machines were really well loved because they had quad core processors. And in 2014, Apple went back to dual core. They made the RAM non-upgradable. And the backlash against that 
was really severe. And I think it's because people were using Mac minis in all these different ways that Apple, I'm sure they were aware of by this time, but maybe they didn't think were the primary use cases, including myself. I was pretty upset that I couldn't replace my 2011 with a new one that you know had half the cores. I, I didn't want to do that. So uh, until this new Mac mini, there's like 2011, 2012 models. A bunch of them are still running around. If you try to go buy one on eBay, People were getting big money for them because it was your only option for a long time if you needed four cores. Yeah, if you wanted it on a server configuration. And we're, we're going to talk later about using one as a server and, and how that works and what the benefits are. But the um, but just from a historical perspective, I as I sit here, I can't think of any other time that Apple has really gone backwards on performance with a quote-unquote upgrade. And with any device... Um, you're, you're the official historian, but I, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure there's an example somewhere, but it is a very unusual thing, you know, especially such a prominent machine that has such a broad user base. I mean, people use these things all over the place for all different things. And I, I think the new Mac mini reflects that better, that it's a really flexible platform that you could do a lot with. Yeah. The 2014 just felt like a swing and a miss, but they've, they've corrected it. You know, we have the new, 2018 model. It's in space gray, which everybody loves, right? You know, it looks cool. Uh, it's the Mac mini that I guess Darth Vader would use, but it's yeah. it's definitely an improvement. I think Darth Vader could attach several to his to his outfit. Mm. Like, yeah. get rid of those analog switches on his chest and just stick a Mac mini up there. That's good. It's slot right in there, right? I mean, the chest yeah. piece is about the same size, I think. Yeah, I, th- I think that would work. See, we solve real problems here on Mac Power Users. Got Darth Vader an upgrade. There you go. <laughs> I guess, you know, it seems like they got it with 2011. There was a period that everybody, in hindsight, is speculating Apple was kind of shying away from Mac. And maybe that's the reason why we had that weird 2014 quote-unquote upgrade and and so much, so many years where it really just got no attention from Apple. But now it seems like they're back in the Mac business. And you're right. We've got a brand new model came out, um, 2018 and, um, and they have actually a performance, uh, quite a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you, so you can spec this thing out from, from basic to a pretty advanced computer. Oh yeah. So uh, a lot of that has to do with the CPU and there's a great link. We have it in the show notes to an article over on Mac observer about sort of like terminology around CPUs. You know, it's, it's a lot different than, in the olden days where you just kind of bought based on processor speed and that was the only factor. Yeah. These options in the Mac Mini in particular really uh, really sort of spread a, a wide gamut. So you have the the Core i3, which is the, the base model, the, that uh, entry-level Mac Mini. It's 3.6 gigahertz, which is great, but there's no turbo boost and there's no hyper-threading. So if you want to read more, go check out that link. But sort of the high level here is... Turbo Boost effectively is like a top speed that can be achieved in bursts. So if you have a really CPU heavy task, like you're encoding a video or you're installing something, the CPU can ramp up to a temporary high speed if Turbo Boost is enabled. And that Core i3 doesn't have that. So it's always running at 3.6. I always thought of that as like if you're in a car and you want to blast past a truck on the freeway, you know, it's got that extra little bit of gas in it. And that's right. It doesn't work for extended periods of time, but it, it is there. And the interesting thing is usually when you need a turbo boost, you don't need it very long. And so yeah. it is a significant improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it also lacks hyper threading. So this is sort of sort of harder to uh, put into an analogy, but basically hyper threading, if that's enabled, it means that for every one CPU core, the system sees two virtual cores. And so if you have a an application that's written to, to take advantage of multiple cores uh, that that can run more quickly. So the i3 is a quad core, no hyper threading, so it just sees four logical cores. Now, I uh, will admit to you, David, that I was hard on this CPU option when it came out, like sort of publicly, like on connected and on Twitter, like this isn't great. But the reality is now that I've actually have uh, spent time with one, and Jason Snell bought this base model. The i3 is an excellent option for almost anyone who's just using it as that sort of switcher mentality, right? You just need like a basic Mac desktop, either at home or at school, or maybe you're uh, an office and you're putting these on people's desks. The i3 is really great. In fact, it benchmarks like 
a, like a MacBook Pro from only a couple of years ago. It's really fast. And what's nice about it is it's going to be the quietest and the coolest out of all of these because it's not turboing up. Uh, it's going to be easier on that fan. Now, all of these are quiet and none of these are, are ridiculously loud machines. But if that's a concern that, you know, the i3 may give you a, a little bit of ground there. I think it's a great option for most people. There are things to upgrade to, which we can talk about, but the i3, I think, is a lot better than it looks like on paper after it's kind of been in the world now for a couple of months. I think it's easy as nerds to get hung up on um, clock speeds and stats on these processors, and you got to stop to think about what you're using it for. Yeah. I mean, if you're running Microsoft Excel or you know doing surfing on the web... Mm-hmm. Uh, this this you're gonna be fine with this i3. Oh yeah, and the i3 actually is the highest clocked of these options. And so, if you have a workflow that's really like single task, single threaded thing, and if you're, you're using an application like a specialty application that is written this way, the core i3 is gonna be faster than the i5 or the i7 in that regard. So there's trade offs everywhere, but the i3 is a is for a lot of people plenty of CPU. If you do need more, there are options. You can go to a core i5, which is now six core as opposed to the quad core on the i3. It's three gigahertz. It has a turbo boost to 4.1 gigahertz. Uh, Still no hyper threading, but the base clock's a little bit lower, but you got more cores and it turbos faster. So a a bit of an upgrade uh, that sets you back about 200 bucks when you order online. And then you can go another level up to get six core, 3.2 gigahertz, 4.2. Six gigahertz turbo boost with hyper threading for an additional three hundred dollars. Right. For all the complaining we did for all those years about how the Mac Mini fell backward, now you can get a six core Mac Mini. I know, yeah, that and the MacBook Pro both have six core options. It's really, it's really sort of mind blowing. I was sitting here just thinking, as you said, four point six gigahertz turbo. I remember when one gigahertz was a big deal, right? Like yeah. the people listening who remember when a hundred megahertz was a big deal. It's it, yeah. these things have come so far. I think my rule of thumb here when looking at CPU is I3 is fine. If you're using it just sort of as a regular workstation, if you're doing some light, you know, audio video editing or doing some like encoding or transcoding in media, the I5 may be a little bit nicer. I think you really only need the I7 if you're doing software development on it, if you're running Xcode on it, you're building iOS apps on it, or you are doing just a lot of AV work, then that i7 may speed some things up. The uh, the i5, you know, is, is pretty well-rounded, but the i3 is no slouch. So I, I don't think you've got to go into buying a Mac Mini thinking you have to upgrade the CPU all the way to get a good machine. I think all three of these options are are good for, for a lot of people. Yeah, and you know, that I think that transcoding video thing is a trap people fall into. They say, well, I'm going to do a video on it, so I need to spend an extra $500. Um, it depends on what kind of video you're transcoding. I mean, most people are not working in like 4K. Uh, most people are doing an iMovie once every month or two with the family, and you can get away with the i3 on that. You do not need yeah. to spend extra money. Yeah, absolutely. The RAM we should talk about, a gigabyte of stock. The RAM is technically upgradable, but you need to take it to an Apple store or to an Apple authorized service provider to do that. You got to basically take the whole machine apart. You risk your warranty if you do that. So that's something to consider. Uh, Eight gigs of stock. I think out of, you you can put 64 gigs of RAM in a Mac mini now, which is just hilarious to me. Yeah. For $1,400. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You could buy a whole another computer for how much that RAM costs. I think, I think if you're using it, even day to day, you know, eight is fine. I think 16 is is kind of the sweet spot, but by no means necessary. And again, you could start with eight gigs and in three or four years, if you want to sort of give it a new breath of life, you could take it into an Apple store and have them put 16 in it for you. Uh, it's only 200 bucks. And if you're doing a lot of editing or a lot of heavier workflow stuff, 16 gigs of RAM is nice and you will feel the difference. But again, for a home use, office use, eight gigs, I think it's plenty. You know, I, I just, these prices I cannot get over on the RAM. I, I don't, I just can't justify it. I, I don't know how they got so expensive. I mean, I, the SSDs, I can like swallow on that. I'm like, all right, SSD, for whatever reason, I can deal with Apple prices on SSDs, but uh, the RAM because the Apple for so, such a long time they were gouging on the RAM. Oh yeah, I mean, for forever almost. But then there was like this nice period where their RAM prices were a little more than you'd spend if you went out and bought it, you know, somewhere else. But it was reasonable, and it feels to me like they're kind of going the other direction again with this. 
Yeah, you know, I know there was like a memory shortage, and there was some like even I think some like price colluding among manufacturers that was going on in Asia. Uh, so RAM has gone up all across the industry, not just with Apple. You know, two hundred dollars for sixteen gigs, like okay, but thirty two gigs for six hundred, like these things don't scale as nicely as I, I wish they would. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, this is you can see how very quickly how you can spend a lot of money on a Mac, Mac Mini, right? You upgrade a little bit here, a little bit there, and suddenly you spend a thousand dollars or more. It's pretty easy to do when RAM is going to cost you two hundred bucks to upgrade to sixteen gigs. Yeah, I think if, if I were giving someone advice, I'd say if you want to upgrade RAM, don't upgrade it beyond 16 gigabyte unless you've got a really, really good reason. Yeah, I I can't help but feel that like in a year, it'll be cheaper to go uh, to an authorized service provider and have them um, have them upgrade the RAM. It'll probably cost you less than six hundred dollars to get to 32. Oh, yeah, I I, I agree. Um, that's always a good option. And, and it's an option we have again. Again, Apple listened to the users of the Mac Mini in this 2018 model fixed a lot of the complaints. You mentioned the SSDs. This, these machines are all SSD, no more spinning hard drive, which is awesome. It's great to have SSDs on the entry-level Mac. Uh, this cannot be changed later, even by the Apple Store. So this is something you need to really look at your needs, see how much, you know, if you're, if you're moving from an existing computer, see how much space you're using. Uh, if you're going to use external storage, that should factor in. It is it is what it is when you order this machine. And, and, and I think the rule of thumb there is get as much as you need. Um, that is a place to splurge a little bit because you can't mm-hmm. upgrade it later. But also, um, there's a lot of ways to manage your storage with an external drive. I mean, it's kind of the idea of a Mac Mini anyway, that you plug things into it. I know there's lots of Mac Mini uh, potential customers out there that are looking to attach it to a NAS drive or some really big hard drives anyway. So just give some thought to that. Uh, the external SSDs are getting increasingly cheaper and better. Mm-hmm. So even though I don't think that's quite as ideal of a solution as having the internal SSD, because you know it's nice having everything in, in one drive, um, you can absolutely, for less money, attach some very fast hard drives, even you know SSD drives to it and run a lot of your software that way. Yeah, I mean, the Mac Mini, that 799 model, starts with 128 gigabytes of storage. Yikes, that's not much. That's not much at all. You can go all the way up to two terabytes for, again, $1,600, again, buy a second computer. You know, I think most people these days, you know, 256, 512, somewhere in there is is probably good. Again, like you said, we've talked a lot about it on MPU and other shows. There are a lot of great services to help manage this stuff from iCloud Photo Library to Apple Music to things like Dropbox Selective Sync. You can get your, your data set down in size if you need to. But yeah, that 128 gig SSD storage, out of all the specs on this machine, this is my biggest complaint. 128 is just it's enough. It, it's pretty pretty tiny. Yeah, and, and especially with the idea that a lot of people are going to buy these as the home repository of their photos library. Yeah, this is going to be the one exception where you do want the computer to download all the photos. And granted, you can locate them on an external drive if you want, but uh, I don't know, 128 is not enough. But I, I kind of feel that way across the board with Apple's um, SSD allocations. I feel like yes. all of them could be stepped up, like all the 128 to 256 and all the 256 to 512. And I would feel a lot more comfortable <laughs> with, with what they're selling. <laughs> Same. Uh, absolutely. We should mention the Ethernet as well, uh, especially in a server context. A lot of these you know, it may end up being hardwired in. Uh, it comes with gigabit Ethernet out of the box, but you can spend just 100 bucks and get... Uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet installed in this. So this does require to reach these speeds. You got to have good cabling and you have to have a 10 gigabyte switch. But say that you have a Mac mini server and an iMac Pro on your desk like I do, you could have 10 gigabit linking them, which would make the the file storage, you know, getting files off, copying files back to it, all of that dramatically faster. I love that this is in the Mac mini. I think it's a great option. Again, it's a nod from Apple that people are using these as servers in their homes and offices. And if you're using it as that, especially if you're going to keep this machine for a long time, your your network may not be 10 gigabyte now, but if that's a possibility in the future, I think this is a pretty easy hundred bucks to add to the cost. Yeah, I agreed. Agreed. I think you, you, this is this is a hundred bucks you'll regret not spending if you're going to use it in that capacity. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by our friends at Luna Display. Luna Display is the only hardware solution that turns your iPad into a wireless display for your Mac. So you'll have a super portable second display with stunning image quality and basically zero lag. 
And setting up Luna Display is so simple. You just get this little little hard little piece of hardware. And mine, I've got the USB C version. It's barely longer than the USB C port itself. Very small. You plug it into your Mac, and you'll be up and running in seconds with everything working over Wi Fi. And if you're someplace where Wi Fi is not available, you can just connect via USB. It's just really simple. Loon Display acts as a complete extension of your Mac. It supports external keyboards, as well as the Apple Pencil and Touch interactions. It's sort of mind-blowing to be using your Apple Pencil on your iPad controlling a Mac, but it works great. It, it basically just turns your Mac into a touchscreen device. Like I said, I've got the USB-C version of this. It's plugged in to the back of my iMac Pro. And when I'm recording audio and I need some things on a second display, or if I am you know, working on a bunch of documents and I want a, a, a reference document open to the side, I've just been doing that with a Loon display on my iPad Pro. So I can have a spreadsheet or something up to the left and what I'm working on on the right in front of me on the iMac. And it's just seamless. Listeners of Mac Power Users can get an exclusive 10% discount on Luna Display. Just go to this URL, lunadisplay.com, and enter the promo code POWER at checkout. That's lunadisplay.com and promo code POWER at checkout for 10% off. Our thanks to Luna Display for their support of this show and Relay FM. All right, so we've broken down the options for your new Mac Mini. Let's talk about what you do with it. Um, and I think probably the starting point is uh, Steve's uh, original presentation, uh, the Mac Mini as a workstation. Yeah, you know, I think that use case has diminished a little bit over time, but I still think it's a completely valid one where if you already have a setup and you just want to drop in a new computer, the Mac Mini is great for that. I, I think, too, if you're looking at, you know, sort of a Mac Mini versus a notebook, there's some things to think about, you know. If you're like, like my old setup before the iMac, I had a MacBook Pro and a display and a keyboard and mouse, right? The MacBook Pro is just in clamshell mode. And, you know, if you're sort of in that environment where your notebook is effectively a desktop replacement, a Mac Mini may be a nice way to go in the future. You already have all the other stuff. You're not really really using your notebook as a notebook. Well, the Mac Mini may be a lot cheaper of an upgrade than, say, a new MacBook Pro or something. So uh, I think that is something that's overlooked a little bit, but I, I think it's totally a valid use of this machine. And it's, it's so, the Mac Mini is so small and quiet. Like you just have it on your desk and you're never going to think about it, right? It's not like these old towers that people used to use. It had to be under your desk and you had to run cables and stuff to them. The Mac Mini is so small and quiet. You can just have it right here next to you. It's totally great. Totally. Uh, uh, it's a great uh, coworker, if you will, at your desk. Well, also, I think, you know, the success of iOS and the fact that so many people are getting a lot of their mobile work done on iOS, and and a lot of those people are carrying laptops around, or they have laptops that sit on a desk that never gets carried around. Right. I mean, not only is a laptop more expensive, and quite a bit more expensive um, a for comparable specs, a laptop also, I, the thing about laptops is they've got so much technology compressed into such a small space that I feel like things can go wrong with laptops, you know, uh, there's just a lot of heat and, uh, electronics jammed into that little case. Whereas with a Mac mini, I think you actually might be, um, I don't know, this is just speculation, but I, I feel like you, you in some ways have a system that may be more stable. I think there's also an angle here talking about a Mac mini versus an iMac, right? If you're just comparing Mac desktop to Mac desktop, well, if you already have a display, obviously this is far cheaper, especially if you're looking at like a retina iMac, Yeah, but Apple's retina displays are really nice. I'm looking at mine right now, and I got to say, yeah. pretty sweet. <laughs> if you can put any display, which you can go on Amazon and get a nice display for a couple hundred dollars, yeah, um, you you will get in there for less money. But uh, just like you, I uh, you are not going to get the iMac off my desk because the retina the, the, for me the retina display is is so great. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like the, the whole vector of this decision, iMac versus Mac Mini. It centers on how important it is to you to have a retina display because you're just not going to buy something out there that's going to look as good as an iMac retina display. I mean, even if you buy the LG, then you're spending six or $700 and then you're back in iMac price territory, right? It's, it's sort of a circular thing. And it's not as good. Yeah. yeah you got that ugly bezel. Yeah. Two, you know, the display does have some cons, right? If the display fails on an iMac out of warranty, that's a really expensive repair. Maybe the computer is still good, but the display is bad. Yeah. I don't know if that's something to really keep you up at night, but it's, it's a factor, I think, worth considering. 
that's always been the thing with the iMac is you always say, well, what happens if the dis- display goes bad on me? Mm-hmm. Or vice versa, right? The display is still good, but now I'm 10 years in and the computer is not cu- you know, meeting my needs anymore, right? It, you sort of have yeah. two things in one to deal with with an iMac. Yeah. There's a thought too of like a, a portable desktop. So you see, I see Mac minis when I travel for work, like in audio video rigs or in, uh, you know, sort of these different sort of mobile desktop environments where you need to take your desktop with you somewhere else. There was an old sure. ad for the original Mac with like uh, at some like university campus and someone like picks up their original Macintosh and puts it like in the basket of their bike and they ride across campus. You can be that person with the Mac mini today, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the original Mac had a handle. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sure. It was, I mean, it was made for it. The Mac mini Sally doesn't have a handle, but it is small. So if you're in that sort of use case where, you know, I need a desktop set up in a couple different environments, or if it's, you know, in the past, I would deploy these sometimes in in offices or in schools for clients where it's going to be used for like a semester in one classroom and then go somewhere else. You know, you just unplug it and move it around. There's some, there is portability to it for a desktop, which is an, an interesting twist that if that is a need of yours, it's kind of, that many is kind of the only thing that that can fill that need from Apple. So that's, that's an interesting angle too. Yeah. I I think it's interesting because there are, I can think of use cases. Let's say you're doing, you are doing some more high end video processing and you get a loaded Mac mini and you've just got a keyboard and, and mouse and display your very, and you go to multiple locations. There is something to be said for just sticking the computer in your bag and heading out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've I've got some friends who work on like professional like video sets for like movies and TV shows, and they're ingesting video footage and audio footage and stuff. And Mac Minis show up there for this exact reason, right? A publication production, I should say, breaks down when the TV show's done. It just goes back in storage and waits for the next show. That's a pretty unique. Uh, feature of the Mac Mini and one that I'm sure Apple did not think about when they introduced it in 05, but people are using using them that way today. So let's say that you fall in that category and you're thinking, hey, I want a portable desktop computer, but you need a good monitor. You know, you want the best caliber monitor you can. What, what's the situation with the 2018 Mac Mini? How many can you attach and how far down that rabbit hole can we go? So if you're using 4K, you can have up to three displays. Uh, you've got Thunderbolt 3, and then you have HDMI. If you're using 5K displays, you're going to have the ability just to use two, one via Thunderbolt and, again, one via the HDMI. Uh, so you know that's a thing to consider if you're looking at your desk setup. If you're a multiple display person uh, and you want three, you're going to be stuck with 4K or lower. But Still, a 4K display on a desk is really nice, and I think most people are probably single or dual display people, in which case, go crazy with the 5K display. You're really going to like it. You want to go do the full Al Gore. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You got to, like, lean back in your chair to see the top one. Uh, That's an option, too. Do you you use multiple displays? I don't. So I have the iMac Pro, and then when I want to use a second display, I use my iPad and Luna display. It's not, um, I've never really been a multiple display kind of person, honestly. Well, I, I added one in, um, in, uh, in portrait mode on, on the right side of my, uh, my 5k iMac. And I use it as a reference. My, I've talked about it in the past on the show, but the, uh, I, I, it, that actually works for me having a little extra display, but I don't want the big wide thing where you, you physically have to turn your head to get to data. Yeah. That's kind of why, why I don't, I'm going to do it. You know, the 27 inch still, I feel like I've got to turn my head a little bit or at least move my eyes around a lot. So it's, it's not for me, but I know a lot of people really love it. And the Mac mini can be the heart of a setup like that really easily. One of the things I like about the new Mac mini is that it's Thunderbolt three and um, which is a fairly accepted standard at this point, I guess we can argue. I, th- I think so. And, uh, and it's got the USB C um, stuff. So you, you've got a uh, ability to expand this. I mean, that's always kind of been the idea is that this is, you know, the, the brain, and then you can expand it with the expansion ports. I mean, we had FireWire to begin with, I mean, just for that reason. Um, so have you looked into some of the things you can do with the USB-C ports in the new uh, uh, Mac Mini? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, a lot of people are going to use them for storage. You know, with the MacBook Pro, USB-C Thunderbolt 3 is your only option. So if you need 
regular USB or you need Ethernet, you need HDMI or something, you've got to adapt out. Well, the Mac Mini has those other ports. So Thunderbolt 3 and USB-C really gives you the ability to drive really fast and like big storage. You know, if you just have the 256 gigabyte internal drive, but you've got four terabytes of data to store, you can now do that over USB-C or even Thunderbolt 3 much quicker than you ever had before. You know, Firewire was great in its day, but Thunderbolt yeah. just simply runs circles around it. I like the the Samsung. Uh, they have uh, the T5, which is a USB-C, really tiny SSD. Uh, and they have a Thunderbolt version 2 that's a little bit more expensive, a little bit bigger, but a lot faster than the USB-C. And these things are just really small. They're bus-powered. They're cool. They're silent. There's no moving parts. It's just SSD. And if you just need a little bit more storage, you know, you need a terabyte more or, you know, 512 gigs more, a single SSD just hanging off the back is a really great option. And you can still back it up really easily because it's just a local drive and it's not going to add heat or noise to your setup. Like, you know, we used to use stacks of external hard drives and those are always make your desk vibrate and, you know, you have to worry about uh, mechanical failure. SSD just gets rid of all those concerns. And, the, and it's going to be cheaper than the Apple internal options for sure upgradable um oh yeah yeah there's a lot to like about that but you can also just hang a big spinning drive off of it which are which is which makes can make sense depending on what you're using the mac mini for that's how i use mine so i have a 2018 mac mini at home it's my home server i'm using a thunderbolt 2 drobo so i have a thunderbolt 3 to thunderbolt 2 adapter and I unplugged my old Mac Mini, plugged the new one right in. The Drobo is seen immediately. So I have whatever it is, 10 terabytes of storage on spinning hard drives because I need that much space. SSD, like to do that with SSDs, yeah, I'd yeah. have to sell my house to, to, to today, buy it. Right? But, you know, it's still in, too in expensive. The future, those, those ports are still going to work. And, I I love I would love <laughs> I look forward to the day I can replace that with an all SSD uh, storage array. But if you need a lot, a lot of storage, spinning hard drives are still your best choice. Um, and still a lot cheaper than SSD. Something they announced with this that I thought was interesting was the the eGPU support because uh, you know this is something Apple's been talking about for several years now. It's an external GPU graphics processing unit that you plug in and just use the port speed to basically put something that used to always be part of the internals of the computer external. And and I knew that they were working on this. It made a lot of sense for me. For instance, that they're selling these with the MacBook Pros. Like if you have a video workstation, uh, the you know the pro, the video card inside your MacBook Pro is is okay, but you know if you're doing a lot of video work and you are a traveling studio, like we were talking about earlier, uh, having one of these boxes you plug into the MacBook Pro suddenly gives it uh, uh, video rendering superpowers. You can do that with a Mac Mini. That's crazy. Yeah. The, the, C, the GPU in the Mac Mini is not incredible. It's sort of Intel integrated graphics on all the models. Doesn't even hold a candle to the MacBook Pro. I mean, it's not even close. It's yeah. pretty weak sauce. But for A, for most people, that's totally fine. But if you do need more, you can do an eGPU. So there's an Apple support documents in the show notes. There's some fine print with this about supported enclosures and supported graphics cards. For instance, this is all AMD stuff. You can use an NVIDIA graphics card, but it's not officially supported, so your mileage will vary there. But there are several options, and there are even some options like the Blackmagic eGPU that you can just buy like as a kit. Like It just all comes ready to go. You don't have to put a GPU inside a chassis and screw it together. And what you get for this is applications that are written to support it, which most of the big, you know, video editing, that sort of stuff, they're ready for it now. You can offload a bunch of that work to a GPU that's in its own case. And with a Mac Mini that is generally kind of always in the same place, like a desk setup, it's just another box to plug in, right? It's not like uh, a MacBook Pro, you have to take the eGPU and the notebook somewhere. If you're just using this as a workstation, it's just on your desk all the time, ready to go. And these things, you know, they use Thunderbolt 3, and then you hook your external display to the back of the eGPU so it gets accelerated as well. It's really pretty cool. You know, this is like, eGPUs are kind of an old idea. Like, what if you had a small computer and it was more powerful when you plugged it into these things? Thunderbolt 3 makes all that possible externally, really for the first time in this way. And so it can be, it can, it can be expensive, but if you want uh, a Mac Mini that has a little more, uh, graphics grunt, this is the way to do it. I feel like um, this is something 
if if we lived in a world where iOS didn't exist, because iOS takes so much of the public bandwidth out of Apple right now, but it, it's like it, it's like future stuff. I mean, can you imagine how much we would have lost our mind just a few years ago if Apple had a box you can attach to any Mac and like triple <laughs> the graphics performance? Yeah. It would be. It would have been. I mean, mind blowing. And, and Thunderbolt three is finally what makes it possible because it has the bandwidth. I mean, Thunderbolt three is effectively like an internal PCI connection over a wire, and so you finally have enough bandwidth to feed these big GPUs and get data back and forth fast enough. Yeah, it really, it really is amazing. I have not used one of these. Again, I've got an iMac Pro that has a big beefy uh, AMD card in it. But if I was still like a MacBook Pro on the go kind of user. I may look at one of these for when I do my 4K video, but uh, this does make the Mac Mini a lot more flexible and, again, more future-proof because you can upgrade that eGPU over time and the Mac Mini kind of stay this, like, computing core that is kind of untouched, but it gets, like, better through Thunderbolt over time. I think that's pretty cool. I love this. I, I feel like it's uh, it's kind of new. I know They've been talking about it for years, but it just feels to me like in the last six months this has become real. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm really looking forward to see where this goes. Like, as I understand it, some there are some configurations where you can chain these things together. And I just, I'm really curious to see how powerful you can get a Mac Mini if you want to spend some money, <laughs> you know, uh, outside the box. Also, I think we should note that we have, uh, Stephen has made reference to an Apple support article. It's the first time since Stephen joined the Mac Power users that he was able to do that. Yes. And I think that is a, a momentous occasion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a an ongoing series on my blog where I, it went up today, I call it K-Base Article of the Week. If you pay attention, it's usually about something else I'm working on. So the one this week was about the Mac Mini. But uh, <laughs> it's funny. I actually now have done it for so long. Sometimes I come across support documents. Like, I think I've read this before. And then I search my own blog and I have linked to it in the past. So again, problems when your blog is a decade old. But yes, it's the first time of many. Maybe we'll get a sound effect or something. Every time I mention support document, you can ring a bell. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> well, it is it is funny when you when you Google a problem and you find the answer on your own blog. I I've done that many times with years. That's kind of an embarrassing moment. Like, oh, <laughs> I've got a problem. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Squarespace. Make your next move with Squarespace. Squarespace lets you easily create a website for your next idea with a unique domain, award winning templates, and more. So what do you want to make on the internet? Maybe you want to make your own online store or create a portfolio of photographs or write a blog so you can search yourself in the future and find answers to your own questions. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that lets you do just that. There's nothing to install, no patches to worry about, no upgrades needed. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Squarespace has got it covered. They have award-winning 24-7 customer support if you need any help. They let you quickly and easily grab a unique domain name, and all of those award-winning templates are beautifully designed for you to show off your great ideas. I really like Squarespace. I've been using it in Max Sparky for a long time, and one of my favorite features is that 24-7 customer support. Occasionally, I want to do something on the website that's out of the ordinary, and I just send a note to Squarespace, and I always get an answer very quickly. I, I know they've got locations all over the world, and you can tell because they respond to those questions no matter when I send them uh, in a very short amount of time. Usually, they've got exactly what I need. Uh, Squarespace plans start at just $12 a month, but you can start a trial with no credit card required by going to squarespace.com slash MPU. And when you decide to sign up, use offer code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain and to show your support for the Mac Power users. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash MPU and the code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase. We thank Squarespace for all of their support. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. So I think we should talk a little bit about Mac OS on a server. So, you know, servers is, it's kind of a word that means a lot of different things, but I think in our context, it's a, it's a computer that is performing tasks for you, you know, whether that be serving files or running applications, kind of 24-7. That's sort of what it's more or less dedicated to doing. A computer you buy for this sort of 
sort of job you need done. Mac OS Server used to be a thing. It was a separate product from Mac OS itself. They used to be like Mac OS 10 Client, Mac OS 10 Server. Yeah. Mac OS 10 Server used to be like hundreds of dollars, and then it became cheap, and then it was free, and now it's gone. Yeah, if you go <laughs> back is, several years in the MP yeah. archives, we did entire shows on how to run mm-hmm. the Mac OS Server software, and we had experts in, and... You know, it was a thing where you could have your own wiki and they had mail servers and all sorts of server based software. And was it last year that they just said, oh, by the way, we're not making that anymore? I think it was last year. It was a year and a half ago, I believe we got that note. Yeah. And most of it got rolled into Mac OS clients. A lot of the sharing stuff just kind of showed up in High Sierra. Mac OS server is still technically a thing, but it is extremely limited in scope. It just has a few functions to it. For I think for I think for everything we've talked about and are going to talk about in the show, you don't need it. Like you can just install Mac OS Mojave out of the box and do what we're going to talk about because they've just brought most of those features over. But you know, it was a, a sad day, but I think Apple like surely there are people who are stuck in a rut because they needed things that Apple just doesn't support anymore. But for sort of the home or small office user, I think everything you would need is still present. It's just now on your Mac out of the box for free as opposed to having to install some other weird OS or some application from the App Store. Yeah. And that's really one of the big questions of this episode is, so what do I do with this Mac Mini beyond having as a workstation? A lot of people are using them as servers, and there's a lot of listeners that are saying, well, I don't really know what that means. Mm -hmm. Um, and that what it means is you've got a Mac in the background, always doing stuff for you. I mean, at at the most basic level. So think about that. Like, let's say you've got a laptop and you've got photos. We we were talking about photos earlier and because it's an Apple laptop, the SSD is probably too small to hold all your photos. Um, with a Mac mini in a closet or on your desk, you could attach an external drive or get one with a big enough internal hard drive and say, photos is going to run on this Mac mini, which is going to be running 24 seven. And this is the one that I want to download the full quality photo of every photo I lift, I upload to my library. And so suddenly you've got in your own house or office, a computer that's got full resolution copies of all of your images. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful because uh, before you bought that Mac mini, you just had um, the online versions with small scale down versions on your laptop. Um, And while I I have not personally heard of people losing photos through Apple server, and I know now now that I've said that the forums and the email (laughs) is going to light up, but, (laughs) but you know, it, there's something to be said for just having your own data in your own house. And that that's one of the many things people do with a Mac mini server. Yeah. And it makes it, you know, that sort of stuff easier to back up because you, you have it all there. I think that the sort of the photos thing you were talking about, that setup can work for a bunch of different cloud services. So like Dropbox, for instance, you may have some folders not synced to your notebook, but your Mac mini that's always there, maybe with a bigger st- pile of storage, you could sync all your folders to that. And then, you know, your time machine or Backblaze or what have you can be backing those files up. You know, same with OneDrive. You could have it just be another place for iCloud uh, Drive to to sync its stuff. You know, sync is not backup, but sync can get your files on computers that you can then back up more easily, which I think is can be really powerful. Yeah, it's, it's the one place you can say, give me the whole enchilada. And right. you can string on as many spinning drives or SSDs or NAS drives as you want to that Mac Mini. And all of the data, you know, all the ones and zeros get delivered to your house or office and you've got them there. Um, Steven said in passing Backblaze, an important point about Backblaze is they don't, um, it's, it's the online backup service I use and they don't back up a NAS drive, you know, a, a network attached storage drive, but they will back up attached drives, drives that are directly attached to the computer. So you can buy a Mac mini with a 10 terabyte drive like Steven has and you and you get a Backblaze account on that, and suddenly um, you you are in the loss column for Backblaze. You're you're one of the accounts they lose money on. You know, and, that's me. And you know what? That's okay. That's <laughs> well, exactly why I have it set up that way. I used to use uh, a NASA. So NASA is just network attached storage. I used to use that. Now I use this for this exact reason. Another really interesting use case is Apple's mail rules. So. If you use something like Gmail, like I do, you can have rules set up like on the server, quote unquote. So 
those rules, so say that you know uh, messages from this person or with this subject get automatically put into this folder, uh, emails from my great aunt who she just sends me the same cookie recipe every time. I can just archive those. All those rules in Gmail get filtered all the time because Gmail is in the cloud; it's always running. iCloud email has some server side rules if you go to iCloud.com and log into your email, but they're very basic. They could be a lot more, uh, a lot more powerful, a lot more flexible. It, it barely, it barely qualifies as server based rules. What what iCloud I, gives I was, you. Just, I was trying to be nice, yeah, but yes, barely <laughs> they're pretty sorry. Yeah. Um, but mail.app, the, the built-in mail client on the Mac, has a very robust system for making rules that apply to any mail that it receives. So iCloud or Gmail, if you just have an IMAP account set up someplace like Hover or, or FastMail or someplace else, then you could do all those rules on your Mac. But the, 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 the sticky bit here is mail has to be running. So again, if you're that user where you have a laptop – and you have an iPhone, well, those mail messages aren't getting automatically filtered and those rules aren't applied unless your laptop's open. But if you have, David, you have your Mac always working for you in the background, like you said, you can just leave mail open and mail rules are just happening all the time and your phone and your laptop are sort of always the way you want them to be because the Mac mini is doing all the heavy lifting as mail comes into it, you know, every time it checks. And I've done that. And it's so satisfying to see something come into... Uh, your inbox on your iPhone and then watch it just vaporize into somewhere else (laughs) because the Mac back at home said, Oh, I got this and takes care of it for you. Uh, That, 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 you really have opened a separate category here. In addition to cloud services that you want to download lots of data from, uh, there's also just some great Mac apps out there that you want to have running 24 seven and Apple mail rules is another example. Another great example I think is Hazel, you know, Hazel, which Mm -hmm. is the auto filing application. And uh, like I've got this, uh, these apps I use to scan documents when I'm on the go, the receipt scanners, you know, like um, Scanner Pro or um, ScanBot. And they save to a special folder on my iCloud storage, which uh, Hazel's looking at. And then Hazel sees that. And if I save it in the right way, Hazel gives it a name and moves it to the right folder, sends a copy to my account, and it does a whole bunch of stuff. I did a whole Hazel field guide, so you can go check that out if you're interested. But the, um, but basically the Mac is at home saying, you know, it's like the dog waiting for you to come home. Is he here yet? <laughs> is he here yet? You know, and then, and then as soon as that file drops in when, after I buy my burger, uh, it immediately does all that processing. The CPA gets the... Uh, it's the receipt before I even eat my burger. And that's great. And <laughs> and that, that happens because I've got a, a Mac running these rules. So with a Mac mini as a server, you can pick those apps that work for you in that way and just leave them running all the time. It's super cool. And it, 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 it lets you build workflows like that, that you couldn't otherwise, yeah. right? Otherwise that stuff would just be waiting for you. And if you're on vacation for two weeks and your laptop doesn't get open, like all that stuff's queued up and, Having something that's just always got your back when it comes to your workflows is really powerful. Uh, I use Hazel on my Mac Mini server before I moved to iCloud Photo Library to do all my photo sorting. So take a picture, upload to Dropbox. Hazel would rename them and automatically sort them for me. It, it really makes – it's like having an assistant or like some sort of uh, you know butler going around behind you making sure all your files are where you want them. And you just don't have to think about it because the Mac Mini is just always on. It uses – very little electricity. It's quiet. You have it on a shelf somewhere, just making your your digital life better. Another great app to have running twenty four seven for this type of stuff is Keyboard Maestro. You know that you can do all sorts of automation that you can trigger uh, on your Mac back at home, or just have it there looking for things to do for you. And um, you know, it's like I, I ta- I've talked on the show how I I really have embraced the iPad in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. but having a Mac running for me at all times is an essential part of how I hold it all together. And if there wasn't a Mac running 24 seven, um, a lot of things would fall apart for me. Yeah. It's amazing how quickly you can build multiple tasks into the server where, 
you know, so all of a sudden you've got five or six or a dozen things running that for me, at least they kind of fade into the background. I kind of like, I kind of forget they're happening because it all works so seamlessly. And then one day it stops, you're like, Oh, what, what happened? I, you know, I must've lost internet at home. <laughs> Manny's not working for me. It, it can be sort of surprising when that disappears on yeah, you. Yeah. It's frustrating. <laughs> like, what, why is everything broken? <laughs> Kate, Katie was having a problem with her Mac mini at one point and she had, um, I'm going to get it wrong. I think she had attached a um, one of those Internet of Things plugs to her Mac Mini so she could remotely just literally yank the plug and plug it back yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Jason did that, too, on his old one. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. if it gets gets frozen or something or is failing, yeah. it's, that's one way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then another whole area of having this all on Mac at your house or your office is the idea of remote access. Yeah, so you can get get into your server from your local network, or even if you're not at home and you need to get in, uh, giving you giving you a way to do that. Uh, so there are a couple of of pretty interesting ways to do this. If you're just on your local network, so for me, and I have my iMac in front of me, my Mac Mini is in the house. I can just use Finder. I can select it in the sidebar, hit Share Screen. And then I'm I'm just controlling my Mac Mini. I don't have to go over to the TV where it is and like find its keyboard. Um, I can just log into it and and work on it in a window. And what's really cool about the way Finder does it is you can drag and drop files in and out. So say there's something on the the server you need or you need to have something added to it, you can just drag it over and it copies it over the network. You can share a clipboard, which is huge if you use something like One Password and maybe it's not set up on your server where you can log into things by, you know, copying it in your one password on your local machine and pasting it on the server. It's really neat. And it's, it it is not nearly as frustrating as you think it would be to have a remote Mac because Mac OS just makes it as native as possible. Just just drag this file over and it does the right thing. Uh, It can be really great, but it does require you to be on the same network. So there's some other options if you need to get in from the outside, right? Yeah. I, when we were, um, when we were in London for, for Hurley's big day, um, I was on South Bank one day doing some work and I, I bumped into a problem. I had an iPad. I didn't have a Mac with me. And I bumped into a problem where I had a web service that just would not play nice with mobile Safari. And so it's like, I don't know, it's like 6 a.m. London time. I use screens, which is uh, connected to my always running Mac back in, in California, logged in remotely, used Safari on my iMac took care of what I needed to and then went back to work. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, there's so many different ways to have that remote connection that you'll find the excuses to use it. Yeah. So I, I use screens. It is a great Mac app that gives you this remote control. And it has something called screens connect. Like you said, you, your Mac is in California, you're in London and you can still get into it. So screens connect is a little menu bar app that runs on the server and it, it basically just tells the screen service, hey, this is my IP address, this is where I am. And you launch screens on your iPad anywhere in the world, and your home server is on there because that Screens Connect app is running. You tap on it, you enter your password, uh, and you're in. There are a couple of things I think we should mention here, though. If you open a, a machine up to remote control to the internet, you got to make sure it's got a good password on it because... It, out on the internet, like it's not visible to other people, right? But you are, you do have an opening to the outside world. Yeah, you, you've you've installed a door. Yes, and you want to make sure the lock on that door is really good. So uh, make sure that your your admin password to log into that computer, your user password is really strong. Um, there there is even an, an argument to be had that if if you do this, maybe actually don't have your stuff in an administrative user. Maybe use a standard user for all of your apps and everything you need to run. So when you log into it, you're not opening admin access directly. It may also require some port forwarding. And the Screens Connect app will walk you through that. So uh, for me, for my particular setup at home, I don't have to do any of that. Screens Connect can just negotiate what it needs. But some setups may require you to log into your cable modem or to your router and say, hey, I need to open these ports to this IP address. And again, Screens Connect can walk you through all that. And it's a one-time thing. You get it set up and you forget it, and then, then you're set. You know, it's funny because I don't run Screens Connect 24-7 on my, on my, my Mac uh, because mm-hmm. of security. You know, I just don't want it. I don't want the door to always exist. Right. Um, so like when I took the trip, I would turn it on if we're going out of town, like anytime I'm knowingly leaving with an iPad and not a Mac, I'll turn it on. 
um, something just occurred to me while you were talking. I could, I could automate this. <laughs> I could make a um, text file like with a certain code in it and just have Hazel look for it and run an Apple script on Hazel to launch Greens Connect. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. <laughs> so like I, so I like, let's say I do find myself a way with, without Screens Connect connected and I need it. And honestly, I need it about three times a year. So it's not a very, very frequent thing. Um, you could, you could create a text file um, that you save to a specific location on Dropbox or iCloud. Then you could just have Hazel looking for a text file with those contents and you make it a very obscure phrase or term or whatever, or one password, you know, long string. And then once it sees that, then you could trigger an Apple script with Hazel. That would it'd be a very easy Apple script just to launch an app. Uh, that would give you kind of a backdoor into launching uh, Screens Connect on your, your Mac back at home or the office from anywhere in the world. That's re- that's great. I really like that a lot. Cause like you said, you're, you're opening a, uh, you're opening a door and it's something to, uh, something to consider there. I'm going to put that in place. All right. So now I have homework. That's good. Do homework and, uh, and write it up for us so we can follow along. Yeah, I will. I will. I, I I'm, I'm thinking I could even put it into a series shortcut. I mean, there's a, you could do a lot with this. There's one last thing I, I will mention while we're talking about this remote connection. If your Mac mini is headless and by that, would mean it's not hooked up to a display. Uh, Mac OS will set the default resolution pretty low. And so when you remote into it, it may be, uh, sort of difficult to get around. And so there's a little uh, HDMI adapter. Our friends at uh, Mac Stadium came up with this uh, and found it. And it's basically just a little, it's just a little dongle that plugs into the uh, HDMI port. And it basically tricks the Mac mini into going into uh, 1080p. So when you log into it remotely, the resolution is a little more usable. Uh, so I use this on our headless Mac Mini that we have with Relay, and it works great. I can connect with screens and everything. It's a 1920 by 1080, a really usable size, and and it's like nine dollars on Amazon. <laughs> it's pretty pretty hard argument. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a little plug. I mean, it's like a half a dollar. Yeah, yeah, it's it's itty bitty. Um, so if you if you run into that where you're remoting in and the resolution is not where you uh, want it to be, then uh, this may solve that problem for you. It's called the CompuLab Display Emulator. And that that's just a cool name. <laughs> uh, that's a great name. I think I just need to get one just for just for the name. This episode of the Mac Powers is brought to you by SaneBox. We all have email. We all have too much email. And it can be difficult to set up the the filtering and all the rules that we were talking about to make it manageable. That's where SaneBox comes in. SaneBox is really smart, and it learns what email is important to you and filters out what isn't important, and it can save you hours during the work week. And SaneBox works with all kinds of email programs and services. You don't have to have a special app. You don't have to route your email through their server. It just works. It's really really easy to to use any mail app you want. So you can use mail if you're like me, or if you want to use a third-party app, all these SaneBox features will follow you wherever you go. It has some really great filtering. You have Sane Later. This is email that you want to get to, but you don't need it in your inbox right now. You can deal with it uh, when you get a little bit of uh, time. And Sane Later is a lifesaver for me. A lot of email goes there, and I sort of deal with it, you know, a couple of times a week, keeping my inbox nice and pristine. You have the same black hole where you can send messages where you never want to hear from the receiver again. Uh, I have quite a few things in my same black hole. David, I thought I could read a couple of subjects from my same black hole. Bring it. Bring it. Let's hear it. Emily emails me several times a week wanting to know if I'd be open to a mutually beneficial collaboration. She keeps asking. Uh, I got an email from Todd wanting to know my coverage topics. That's all it says. Coverage topics, question mark. The email, it's just spam. It's just junk. It didn't get caught by my spam filter. It's just PR stuff I don't want. I think my my favorite, though, right now is the design and build of work culture and leadership. I mean, work culture and leadership is a thing to think about, but I don't need that in my email. I don't need that in my inbox. So it's in the same black hole, and I don't have to deal with it anymore. My, my, my favorite right now is Marcus wants to talk to me about mutual synergies. Oh, that's important in the new year to think about. 
So that's in my black hole. Sorry, Marcus. <laughs> As it should be. You get a snooze email. So it's something you need to deal with, but you can't get to it to the next business day or maybe the weekend. You can set up snooze folders and drag mail in. You could do sane reminders. This is really powerful. So say that I email David a thing about the show and I CC one week at sanebox.com. Well, in a week, Sanebox is going to remind me, hey, you know, you emailed David, but you never... You never heard back, so maybe you should check in on that. Uh, it, it just makes it really great. You can even set a date. So say, hey, remind me of this email on tax day. You can CC it to April 15 at sanebox.com, and then you'll be reminded on that date. Uh, you can move attachments to Dropbox and other cloud services. You can, like I said, put stuff in the same black hole and never deal with it again. Lots of filtering, lots of great power user options. There are various pricing plans. They start as low as about $4 a month. You can get a 14-day free trial, and 66% of MPU listeners who try SaneBox subscribe. I know I had decided way before that my 14 days were up, this was a service I needed to keep my email under control. If you go to SaneBox.com slash MPU, you'll receive a $25 credit on any plan. And like we said, there's a 14-day free trial, so you can see if it works for you. Thanks to SaneBox for supporting this show and Relay FM. All right, so we've been uh, talking about the things you can do with a server. What we haven't, one topic we haven't covered that I think is kind of um, important for your home server is media. I think it's a huge use case, right? We have movies and TV shows or other things that we want in a central repository, but you know that's not going to be our laptop, for instance, or our iPad. And that, and that always starts with Plex. Well, we did a whole <laughs> show on Plex years ago, yes. but it's still just as good. I mean, it's great uh, with with Plex. It's a, um, in fact, it's better now because it used to be you had to do all these hacky things to get Plex running as a server, and now they've got a. Of course, it's a subscription, right? But they've got a service that you can uh, attach. You can have not only the the stuff serving up to your home media at your home, you can even have it uh, serving up to you when you're on the road. Yeah, and it, you just install the server app on your Mac. Again, you set it up, and and your your media is just available to you. It's really awesome. You can share it with friends. So you've got a friends with a cool Plex library. You can log in and watch their movies. Yeah. Hello, Casey Liss. It's really great. Uh, there is. One little sort of follow-up to the CPU conversation, though. There's an article on Plex's website talking about the CPU requirements if you're going to do a lot of encoding. And depending on the type of media you have and kind of how you input it, you may need to do on-the-fly encoding, and they recommend an i5 for that. But if you do your research and kind of see how Plex wants this stuff to be formatted, this is I don't think this is as big of a deal for a lot of people who are sort of on top of this stuff, but just be mindful of that, that if you're going to do some live encoding, the i3 is not necessarily going to cut it. But isn't that also one of the selling points of a Mac mini versus a network to test storage that even the lowest in Mac mini runs circles processing wise around most oh, yeah. of these NAS devices? Yeah. If you go buy something like a Synology, they have specific models for media encoding and you got to make sure you get the right one and that it supports whatever. Uh, so just having it as a Mac app again just makes it makes it a lot simpler. You know, I run a Plex server on mine, and what I what I have in my Plex server is old Apple Keynote videos. So instead of just going through a folder in Finder, I can just fire up Plex if I, like for this episode. I wanted to watch the MacWorld 05 where you introduced the Mac Mini. Yeah, I just found it on my Plex server and was off to the races in just a couple of minutes. It's great. I don't even think about it running. It just it just uh, launches and runs automatically. I love that about you, Stephen. That you have all the <laughs> keynotes. It's uh, it's great. Um, Even you have the one with the socks. You got that one. Um, oh yeah, oh, I've, got, I've got I've got them like going way back. <laughs> it's important to have your iPod socks all covered up. Well, so you can run Plex. You can also run your iTunes server as well. Uh, iTunes lets you download everything. If you've got that big hard drive attached to your uh, to your Mac Mini, why not? Yeah, I, I do this. You know, so if we purchase, let's say we purchase a movie on the Apple TV. The Mac Mini will just be in the background downloading it so it's on the Drobo for future use. I think this is maybe a little less important in the world of like streaming and Apple Music, but it's definitely still available. And, you know, we still buy a fair amount of like TV shows and movies on iTunes. So it is it is there. Um, We also have kids that who have like they each have like an iPod Nano and. I use the iTunes library on the Mac mini to sync music to that. So we still purchase some music like soundtracks to kids' movies and stuff. And just have a, just have a lightning cable dangling off the back. And, you know, I plug that iPod 
nano, you know, the iPod nanos in a couple of times a year and sync new music to them for the kids. But I think that's probably less important than it was, but it is a great option that iTunes still provides you. Just like anything you buy, I can download it. I'm just going to download it so you know you have it. It's pretty cool. If you go back long enough in the MP archives, I mean, there was a time when I was way, you know, deep into this stuff because, you know, when your kids are young, they will watch the same show a thousand times. Oh, you yeah. Know? So you need the the whole system. You know, you need to have a way to serve it up. And, and back in those days, it actually was quite difficult, you know, with all the, the ways you had to, you had to get the, the ones and zeros onto the drive and how you, how you had to get them on your TV. Uh, but I have completely fallen off the wagon on all that. At this point, for me, it's just like I buy it on iTunes. I stream it through my Apple TV. I don't even run a Plex server anymore. So I, I am the the worst candidate for this this type <laughs> of stuff. Because I just don't, you know, I looked at all those movies that I had ripped of, you know, I am not going to be watching the Barbie Princess movie, you know, and my kids don't watch it anymore either. So, <laughs> you know, and uh, so I, I just dumped all that stuff. Sure. You know, and, uh, but the, uh, but yeah, if you need it, this is, it's way easier and way better than it ever was before. Oh yeah. And there's a lot of people who are just like streaming only, right. Who, who never yeah. ripped all those DVDs and like us talking about that. They think it's bananas. Like, why don't you just stream it? But yeah. it, it's a, it's a nice option. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can't stream. And so iTunes is a great fallback and having it set up automatically means, you know, again, our Mac Mini is hooked up to our television via HDMI. In fact, that's how we watch kids' DVDs still. <laughs> have like sure. the, the USB Super Drive on it, which is not the same color as the Mac Mini anymore, which really bothers me. <laughs> I bet it does. <laughs> <laughs> just cover it up with some tape. But the Apple TV is the main interface for our television. So we yeah. purchased something on there. I just know if I, I hit buy, and a couple of minutes later, I can hear the Drobo spin up, and I think, ah, iTunes saw that I bought something and is downloading it for me. Yeah. So it is it's, nice it's a nice safety it. net. Yeah, yeah, it is. Exactly. I just like with photos, I'm a hundred percent in there with you. I, I want photos downloaded locally. Oh yeah. You know, with, with uh, my copy of, uh, of round midnight, it's okay. I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> um, another, another big use is file sharing, you know, in addition to your media, what about just your home file system? Yeah. So the, again, this is something that you used to have to have Mac OS server for if you wanted a lot of fine grain control, but now it's just in the sharing preference pane <laughs> and system preferences. So easy now. It's so easy. You flip a switch. So easy. And you have file sharing in your house. It's great. You can you can say, I want to share this folder. So like in my case where I have a Drobo, I just share the whole Drobo uh, just with the network. But if you have specific folders you want certain people to have access to and other people not, you can set up folders. You can set up permission based on user. So you can say this, if someone logs in as this user, they have access to this folder, but not access to to that other folder over there with the secret stuff in it. And you even have different privilege permissions. So you can say, okay, uh, you know, people can read and write to this folder, but people can only read data from this folder. So if you wanted to share files with a family member, but didn't want them to be able to delete them, you can make it read only. You can do the opposite and say, make this a write-only Dropbox where people can submit folder, submit files into this folder, but they can't get things out of it. And I used to set this up all the time for teachers and schools where they could just have a folder and the, the students could just drop in a Word document or a Pages document and turn in their assignments. It was great for that. Yeah. I did that, for instance, when I, I, I kind of lied because I, while well, I stopped the serving the, the Barbie movies, I mm-hmm. did put them on a folder <laughs> and they are shared. My kids can get access to them. And as strange as it sounds, as they are older, they still occasionally want to go back and watch the shows they watched as kids. So, sure. so they're, they're around, but it's not served up the way I was. I used to be doing it. I, I would imagine you've done something similar with all your Apple keynotes. I mean, I'm sure your wife wants to get in there and look at those <laughs> all the time, right? Oh, yeah. Just, it's, you never know when she's going to... Uh, be like, oh, I wonder, uh, you know, what was it like when the iPod video was introduced? Yeah. But <laughs> a, a cousin to file sharing is a shared folder for Time Machine. So, again, in our sort of uh, imaginary household we've been talking about, we have the Mac Mini with a big bucket of storage. We got a couple users with laptops. So, you know, yeah. it could be difficult to remember where the USB drive is or to plug it in. And so all of a sudden it's months and, you know, some laptop user in your household has not backed up their stuff and then disaster strikes. A Mac mini can solve that too, right? Yeah. And, and you know, this, this uh, kind of treads in the territory of time capsule, but Apple is getting out of the business of time capsule. So, 
this really is the, the modern solution if you want to have your laptop owners getting backed up reliably. Mm-hmm. So it's, again, it's set up in the sharing system preference pane. You basically pick a folder and then you right click on it. There's a little contextual menu where you can go into advanced, enable time machine. I think one of the smartest things here is you can set a quota. So say that you have a, a two terabyte drive dedicated to, you know, time machine drive backups and I've got two users, I could have a quota for one terabyte each. And when they set up Time Machine on their laptop, it just shows up as a terabyte worth of storage. And so they're not going to have one user overfill the drive and the other user not be able to do a whole backup. You can segment it out and make sure everyone has uh, an appropriate amount of storage. That is super helpful and really useful if you're doing this for, for multiple users. You know, if it's just your laptop onto your server... Who cares? But if you've got kids running around with notebooks or a spouse or, or a roommate or something, it can really save you a lot of headache down the road when your time machine volume is full and people can't back up and you know, or you have to add somebody down the road. It's like, oh, no, uh, what do I do? This sort of segmentation you can do in here can really save your bacon. Yeah. So, And a couple of points on this. Number one is this is an excellent uh, use case to buy a cheap spinning drive. You know, you can get definitely like I think on Amazon, you can get a five terabyte spinning drive for like one hundred and fifty dollars. And then the second thing is this is one of the things where we, I think, uh, benefited from the demise of Mac OS server, because this is baked into the operating system now. Um, like you don't necessarily need to go buy a Mac mini to do this. If you've got an iMac that's running 24 seven, or even if you've got that laptop that you never unplug, uh, this is something you could use with any Mac in your house. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's a, you just plug it in there have it under the desk and forget about it. It's really, really sweet. But if it's not there, when the laptops look for it, that's a problem. So you really want to, you really want to have something that's connected all the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. What about, um, uh, content caching, you know. Um. Yeah, this is sort of a, a strange one. It's it's one that Apple doesn't have. There's like a, not a lot of explanation in the Mac OS preference pane stuff of what this is or what it does. But if you enable this, uh, basically what it's doing is Apple, like the Mac will use however much store space you allow it. And again, you can set a default amount here so it doesn't have to overrun your whole drive, you can say, hey, just use, you know, half a terabyte for this. And what it's going to do is Apple is going to use that space to uh, store temporary files that that systems on your network may need. So a good example of this is uh, a new software update comes out for the Mac. And if you have content caching turned on, that will download it and it will make that file available to the other Macs on the local network. So you're not going out over your internet service provider three times to run the same update on three Macs. The content caching is designed to like reduce that bandwidth usage and, of course, speed up installation. Yeah, I mean, installation was the only use case I could think of for it. <laughs> it's about it. Uh, and it, it's pretty invisible, like you're client machine is not going to tell you, oh, I use content caching to download this, right? Like basically you just have to trust that it's working. Now you can open activity monitor on the server and there's a, if you have this running, there's a cache tab that shows up there. And so I just looked at mine and over the last 30 days, my content caching server has saved or has served 23 gigabytes in the last month. So I don't know what's in that 23 gigabytes, but I know that the Mac mini server with this Drobo has saved at least a, a, a large amount of bandwidth over my Comcast connection because it downloads it once and then shares it. I am super curious about that now. I mean, what is happening, Stephen? I, 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 I guess we're on a lot of Mac OS <laughs> updates. I, I don't know. <laughs> iCloud can also use this. So I think uh, things like iCloud Photo Library and, and maybe Apple Music, these other services can dip into the storage. So it, it's doing a lot of stuff, but it's pretty opaque about what's happening. I have it turned on. You know, I have a lot of storage. I think I dedicated a terabyte to mine. Seems fine. It, it, it does seem like sometimes I go down with something like, wow, that was really fast. Like, well, and then I think in my back of my head, well, my Mac Mini grabbed it. I don't think this is a reason to go buy a big hard drive just to dedicate to this. But if you have the space, it's a, it's a nice extra, I think. Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I've always written this off, but now you, that's a lot of saved <laughs> 
downloads. I, I wonder if you took your laptop, like go to Starbucks with your laptop and open iPhoto. I'm sorry, photos. <laughs> I call it iPhoto. Uh, and, you know, you're going to have the caching thing on your laptop and then do the same thing at home. I wonder if you can do some A-B testing to figure out. Yeah. I wonder if it's like serving all your photos for you from that. I don't know. That, uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, but it, it 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 seems faster and it seems like it's doing something. So like I said, if you've got the space, this may be an interesting thing to do. Uh, another use for uh, a Mac mini or a server that a lot of people don't realize is you can roll your own VPN. Yeah. Th- this is one of those things that was in macOS server that kind of didn't make it to macOS client, at least in the GUI. So there's not a place in system preferences to like enable this. You can do it on the command line. There's a link in the show notes that talks about that. If you're familiar with the terminal, you could do it. It's not the most approachable thing in the world. But the um, there's a $15 utility called VPN Enabler from Mojave that basically uh, – and this developer has been in a lot of really cool Mac utilities over the years. But it's a, a little Mac app that sort of gives you a front end to that stuff. So if you want to set up a VPN without – going into the command line to, to enable it, uh, this little $15 utility can do this. And what's nice about this is you can have a VPN so your connection is secure. You're routing your connection back through your Mac Mini at home when you're out on public Wi-Fi somewhere. And if you don't want to pay for like a VPN service like many of us do, if you just need it every once in a while, uh, this can be a really nice option. Uh, or if you just want to have a VPN for your traffic at home, this can do that as well. So it's a use case I know like Dan Morin uh, and Jason Snell have talked about in the past. I think Dan still uses it. It's a little harder to do than it used to be, but it can be a really nice feature, especially if like if you're if you have like fiber at home or like a really fast internet connection and you want to take advantage of it in some interesting ways, this may be worth looking into. Hey, let's take a minute to talk about our sponsor, the Omni Group. And specifically I want to talk about Omni Focus 3. Over the last year, the Omni Group has been Super busy, and they've released some great updates for OmniFocus. Version 3 now is out for the Mac, the iPad, and the iPhone. And it has a lot of useful features if you want to get your act together in terms of your task management. One of the big ones is the ability to add tags now to your tasks. And I've been really enjoying having tags in my task system. I've got tags for all sorts of things. I've got, I just added a tag for setting up a Hazel uh, Apple script to automatically start a, uh, <laughs> my remote access. So, uh, you know, you can use this to get to very specific pieces of your OmniFocus database and just give you the tasks you need to see. We're all really busy, and it's easy to get overloaded with your task. You you have too much data in your task database. You look at it, you just get a headache, and you walk away. Well, that's what these tags allow you to do. It allows you to slice and dice and get to what you just need. But it's not just tags that allow you to organize your OmniFocus data. You can also organize it by project. Uh, You can create custom perspectives. And it also has that amazing review process. And this is something that I think OmniFocus does that everybody else should do, but nobody seems to figure it out. Uh, Review allows you to see your projects at certain increments of time to see if they're still relevant to you and if you've dropped the ball on something or if you just need to re-kickstart the project or even if you want to kill the project. Having that review tab available to you allows you to do that. Um, I've been using OmniFocus for as long as OmniFocus has existed. I've tried other ones. They, they just don't match for me because I have so much going on. And this is a task manager that does such a great job of, of keeping up for me and, and allowing me to get my work done. I love it. Use it every day. To learn more, head over to the omnigroup.com slash omnifocus. You can download a free trial there. Check it out for yourself. Uh, there's lots of online resources. I've got some free stuff on my website to kind of help you get started. But just find out how much more efficient you can get in 2019 with something like OmniFocus at your back. Once again, that website is omnigroup.com slash omnifocus. Let them know you heard about it here on the Mac Power Users. So we've talked a lot about using a Mac as a server today. I think there's a lot of great use cases for it. My favorite is just running Mac apps all the time. Something like having Hazel all the time is just invaluable. Yeah. Uh, But there there are some alternatives. We spoke a little bit about like a network attached storage or a NAS device. These are, you know, they're basically little computers, right? Like they usually run some sort of Linux, have a little OS on them, and you can stuff them full of hard drives. I mean, some of these have like 15 or 18 hard drive bays, 
if you need that much storage. Not usually for home, but yeah, they exist. <laughs> that's going to sound like a tornado going through your house. But, yeah. Uh, they are there. I, I used one for a long time. And like I said earlier, I moved away from this because I wanted to do cloud backup more easily on all of my data. You can do it on something like a Synology, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through and it may not be officially supported by the provider you want or the version of the software in Synology may not have it. So you got to use like a third party thing. It's just a little bit messier. And, and ultimately for me, I wanted the backup. And I just, like I said, I wanted a Mac doing this stuff because I'm most familiar with the Mac, definitely more so than like the OS that was running on my previous NAS. And so it just made sense for me to bring a Mac into this role, but it, it can be a good alternative if you have some specific needs or you just need like as much storage as possible. You don't care about the sound or the weight of it. You know, you, this is a, a viable option for a lot of people too. But like when you do something like Hazel, that's just not going to work on, right. on that solution. And, and I, I think for a lot of people that are considering this, you need to think about whether or not you want to run Mac apps. Because if you do, if you want that ability to tunnel in and run a Mac, um, or if you want to have Hazel doing stuff in the background, you're going to have to get yourself a Mac. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's Synology, you know, it, it does have its strong suits. You, you mentioned like backup for an office is a huge one. But a lot of these have like applications that can run directly on them. So you can do some of the stuff. Like I remember from mine, I had an app that ran and it looked at the master feed from uh, Relay's website and just downloaded ev every MP3 we published. Like now I can do that on my Mac and use a different method for that. But you can't do a bunch of that stuff for, you know, w with the tools on the on a, a NAS. But if you're familiar with the Mac or you just need a Mac application, the Mac Mini, I think, is a more attractive, more attractive choice, at least for, at least for me where I am. Yeah, I agree. And and later, because you actually have several Mac minis in your life between your business and your home. And I, <laughs> I want to actually go through those at the end of the okay. show and have you explain why, how you configured them and why. Sure. I am somebody who has been on the fence about the Mac mini as long as the Mac mini has been around. I've always understood why they existed. And, and I thought it was cool when you see someone run a whole law office on a Mac mini server or uh, see some of the things you're doing with your Mac minis. But uh, because I have this fancy iMac on my desk and I just leave it running all the time, I've never been able to convince myself that I need to go spend more money on an additional Mac. You know, it's, it's sure it comes, it comes with additional overhead. You know, if you're going to have another Mac, you've got to make sure it has the updates yeah. and you've got to make sure the software is running and you've got to get the Hazel rules on it, installed on it and all those things. And, and for me, I've always just kind of felt like, well, I've got the iMac. It, I don't really turn it off. And I can get most of what I need just running that. Like I can hang a lot of drives off this as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that I, I think that's a question for some people is what is that tipping point between if you've already got a Mac sitting on your desk versus, you know, at what point do you need to go the extra mile and, and get a Mac mini? Yeah, I think that's a, a, there's a lot of possible ways into that. I think if you don't run your iMac 24-7, so I leave mine on all the time as well. So I, I could do all this on my iMac. Uh, it's on 24-7. But if it wasn't, you know, that would be an issue. The real reason I use one, and maybe this will be helpful to some people, is really really two reasons. One, I do have a two-hour television to play DVDs. And so it's in the entertainment yeah. center, not out here in my studio. But the, the biggest one is that that Drobo is too noisy for me to record with in the room. Yeah. And I didn't want yeah. to have to like turn it off or, you know, eject it and turn it off every time I need to record. And so for me having it, like it's in the den, it's a little noisy. I mean, it's kind of like in the entertainment center, it's a little annoying, but it's better than having it on my desk. Again, the future of like all this, like 10 terabyte SSD, like sign me up when I can afford it and not have to sell my house. But until then, uh, for me, at least I don't, I don't want all that rotating storage on my desk. And so the Mac mini allows me to sort of put it elsewhere. It's accessible on the network. I can go control it directly through the TV. I have a keyboard and a mouse hooked up to it if I need that, but it just sort of removes it from my everyday working environment. That was important to me, but it may not be important for everybody. I think if you have an iMac or, you know, another desktop and it is your primary system, or even if you have a laptop that is effectively a desktop, you know, you can do a lot of this cool server stuff you know, on that system. But if that's a system that could go away, if you take it to work, 
and the file server turns off, or if you shut down the iMac at night and you can't access your stuff, it's something to contend with. You know, a server in my mind is going to be 24 seven. I just want it as like a background thing available at all times, not just when I'm at my desk. Hey, you know, I think there's a tipping point, And to me, it, it involves storage. It's like, like right now, I have underneath my desk here, Velcro to the bottom of the desk, a three, five terabyte um, laptop style drives mm-hmm. connected to this iMac, you know, between backups and archive storage and other things. So I've got three of them. It's like, do I, do I put a fourth? Because when we were talking about using this machine as a time machine for the family, yeah. I was thinking, oh, I would have to buy another. So do, am I going to put four <laughs> drives on this thing? Yeah. At what point does it become ridiculous? Right. So I think if you're going to do media serving, like if you're going to serve up a bunch of media in your home, you probably need one. Um, the, the, I, I, but to me, it seems like it really comes down to how much data are you going to sling around? And at some point, it may just need its own Mac. Yeah, I think that's that's a great way to go about it. And if you're looking to add one, you don't have to go out and buy – the most expensive Mac mini don't even necessarily have to find a new one, right? You can find uh, a gently used, uh, you know, 2014 or 2012, even Mac mini, especially if you're not doing a lot of video encoding or that sort of work. If it's basically just going to be a file server, you don't need a lot of computer to do that. And that may make it a lot more affordable. Or if you, you know, upgrade a family member's iMac or like a a friend of mine for a long time, used his 17-inch PowerBook as a home server. Now, that's sort of hilarious because it's an enormous laptop, but it, he just had some hard drives hanging off of it. It was up in a closet somewhere always on, and he already had it, right? He didn't have to sell that machine and go buy something else. He could repurpose an older Mac. And if you're just sharing files and doing time machine backup and that sort of thing, that's totally fine. You don't need something brand new. I got a better one. I have a friend who has a destroyed laptop screen, and... Literally, I mean, the screen is, uh, it, it looks like somebody shot a bullet through it. I don't know what, what happened, you know, but <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the computer runs fine and, uh, except there's no screen and he runs it as a headless server, stuck it in a closet yeah, in his house. Literally a headless server. Yeah. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's sad. I kind of admired that though. I thought, well, Hey, you You've know what it. that, yeah. that it's keeping the, the Mac running and, yeah. and it's still doing a job. I him. like that. Yeah. I, I like that, uh, reuse approach it can be it can be a great way to, to cycle a mac you know from from sort of everyday use to secondary use a machine that may still have life in it and yeah there's no need to go out and get something new unless you're doing a lot of plex encoding or you're using it to like offload development tasks or something like that then yeah you're probably going to want something newer but for a lot of people even the way i use mine honestly i didn't need a new one i replaced my 2011 because it was on its last legs. And sometimes it would start up and forget that it was a Mac and, you know, lose its boot drive and do all this crazy stuff. I was like, okay, I've had it, you know, seven years. I'm okay to upgrade this, but you don't have to do that every time. Yeah. And it's probably less time to replace it before it fails than the wait till it fails and try and put it back together again. What, What about, we haven't talked too much about the small office server and we've talked about the home server. Um, at the top of the show, we were mentioning that like that 2011 uh, optical driveless quad core um, mm-hmm. Mac Mini was a great office server solution. You think that's still true with the new with the new 2018s? I think it is. I think a lot of people in small offices who want a Mac server have used a Mac Mini for a long time. Again, a use case that maybe wasn't on everyone's mind at the beginning, but for all the same reasons we've talked about it being a good home server, I think all of those apply to an office server, especially like the time machine backup. Uh, My last job I had, we were all Macs and we ran a a Mac mini with like a huge Lassie raid and it was our file server. And then it was our time machine drive and it was accessible to everybody in the office. And that can be a really like affordable way to do it as opposed to coming up with some sort of like quote unquote enterprise solution and blah, blah, blah. Like, a Mac Mini and a big drive will take care of a lot of your needs. And so I think there is still a use case for for office servers in this in this space. And I think – honestly, I think the use cases between home and office are probably uh, – there's probably fewer differences than you might think. And one of the one of the issues really is I don't think that many people use office servers anymore, you know, because everything is so cloud based. Absolutely, I think I think the Google Drive and Dropboxes of the world did like the office server in much more than 
Apple not updating it for a long time, right? Like, yeah. Just move it to the cloud for everything, and and that's fine. Something I've always been fascinated with, I've never done this before, and I know you have, is offsite Mac Mini. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you get a Mac Mini, you put it some location somewhere. And it used to be called Mac Mini Colo for a long time, but I guess now they changed their name to Mac Stadium. Is that yes. the way? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so if memory serves, they're in Nevada, but I'm not really sure where they're at. Uh, yeah, they've got data center in Nevada, and they got a couple others. Uh, and Mac Stadium has sponsored relay stuff in the past, and in fact, our my offsite Mac Mini is at Mac Stadium. If you listen to any of Relay FM's live shows, so like connected and some other upgrade, we stream the show live as we're recording it. That is all routed through that Mac Mini, and that Mac Mini is a 2011. The Ethernet jack died on it, so I'm using a dongle to get Ethernet out of it. So that's probably due for an upgrade. <laughs> yeah, it sounds <laughs> they, like they, it. they called and like, hey, you're, you know, your Ethernet port looks like it's acting up. So we put a dongle on it. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> 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 so it's still still going strong. Having an off-site Mac server gives you all the utility we've talked about in your home, but it puts it out on like a really fast internet connection. So if you're moving a lot of data and you're traveling a lot you know, that can be a nice option. You can have a VPN server going through a, I mean, a really fast data center, not like your home Comcast. You can even host web, I mean, host big websites on a Mac mini server because you have an IP address and power and cooling and all this stuff in a data center, but you get all the benefits of running a Mac. So the relay server, uh, we do the live streaming software on it. And then we have our Dropbox account signed into it. And you know, Relay is just like a bunch of shared Dropbox folders between hosts and everything. And we have everyone add this like sort of nondescript Relay email address to it. And that email address has a Dropbox account. And so all of the Relay folders for all the podcasts get synced through that Mac Mini, which is getting backed up again to Time Machine and to Backblaze. And on occasion, that has saved someone of like, oh... I deleted this file. I can't find it, and I can go get it off that Mac Mini. And it, you know, it's not necessary, but it's I have the space and I have the bandwidth, and it's just a nice safety net. You know, we can store some files there that I know will be safe and sound, not on a cloud service. Because like, I own that Mac Mini. I, I shipped it to Mac Stadium, but that's my computer, and I can call them and I can get it back. And it, it gives me some sense of peace about it that it's on hardware that I own a control to a degree. And it makes a lot of sense for a distributed company because you've got one person in London, one person in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and then you've got assistants that are spread across the globe. So it's not like everybody's going to a single office anyway. Right. Yeah. And it's always available because again, it's in a data center. I could do that out of my house, but like a tree falls down in my backyard and our server's down for two days, right? Like it's in yeah. a, like a, like a big boy data center with like armed guards and air conditioning, like it's going to be okay. And that that like bedrock stability can be huge again, especially if you're using a Mac to host a website or to provide some mission critical function to your job or your life, then having that extra safety net of like it's run by people who do this for a living can be a nice, a really nice thing. Okay. I've got this vision in my head and I do not want you to correct me. Okay. <laughs> okay. But it's of the, the relay Mac mini server. And there's like a couple guys with machine guns, you know, like U European security level, um, just just standing around. <laughs> I can't confirm or deny that, of course. W with with dead eyes, definitely have dead eyes. Yeah, all right, great. Yeah. <laughs> great. <laughs> so, so Stephen, I like I said, I I have been tempted by the fruit of the Mac Mini, but never actually uh, bought one, and mm -hmm. I, I don't think I have. Well, at least at this point, because I'm getting by okay. Although, sure. Maybe once I get six drives hung off this thing, maybe yeah. they'll all... You're going to run out of uh, double-sided sticky tape at some point, right? Yeah, exactly. Or or, or, or uh, square footage underneath my desk or yeah. the other. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or maybe it's just... Maybe that's one of the reasons this room gets so hot. I don't know. But the uh, but you've got several. So let us know. You know, you talked... Okay, so we talked about the one at Mac Stadium. So I think yeah. we've got a pretty good idea of that. But you bought a new one. How did you configure it and why and... and How's it working for you? Sure. So the, the one I have at home, like I said, it's serving that Drobo to the network. Um, so it's got that over Thunderbolt. And all of my 
like work files that I'm not actively working on are stored there. So like this episode of MPU, as I go through the edit, will be on my iMac. But when I'm done with it, I'll archive it on the Drobo. Um, And I have just years of project files there. We have our iTunes library on the Drobo as well. I have it set up as a time machine target uh, for uh, my MacBook Pro. So it's just backing up when I'm at home, which is really nice. It does a bunch of stuff. So that Drobo is very busy. Uh, I share my iTunes library from it. And then I have uh, I have a few like sort of background processes going on as well. Um, I've got Hazel doing a very sim- similar thing to what you described, where I can just scan something from my phone and it ends up in the right place. Um, you know, if, depending on how I save it, that's really handy. I've got a utility called... Um, a carbon copy cloner, which is like a backup utility, which y'all have talked about before. It's a it's a sure. great backup utility that I back up the Drobo and the Mac Mini to like external drives. There's like five of them now because I have so much data, and that just yeah. runs on the Mac Mini server. And I I don't have to do anything. I just plug in a backup drive, and it detects it and backs up automatically. So I don't even have to log into it for that sort of thing. Um, it's all really handy. As far as configuration, I bought the i5 because I do some Plex with it. You know, I, I'm not using the CPU very often on it, but I, I like that it's there. Uh, and I did the 16 gigabytes of RAM. And, and both of those kind of sound like future proofing to me more than yes. the immediate need. The last one lasted seven years. Uh, and, you know, say that my iMac Pro, something happens to it or something happened to my wife's iMac, I could, if I need to, I can work on this Mac Mini, right? Like I could pull it out of the entertainment center and plug it in somewhere and use it as a workstation. Uh, That actually happened with my old one a couple of times. And it was nice to have just like a a spare Mac. But it's got, you know, the stock SSD in it because all the storage is external. So I felt like the i5 and the 16 gigs RAM was a little future-proofing, but... uh, You know, I didn't, I I didn't definitely didn't feel like I needed to go higher than that. I, I kind of barely could justify what I did, but it's uh, it's nice to have a little breathing room. Again, if anything, for, for just longevity. And of course, it's running Mojave. You know, nothing special there about the, the, the software or the OS because all that stuff's built in now, like we talked about. You don't have to run some crazy file manager thing like you used to. It's just all built in, which I really appreciate because it keeps things a lot simpler when you're troubleshooting or, or setting something up new. Yeah, I, I thought about that, you know, having one just because I, I run my whole enterprise, my legal and Mac Sparky stuff on one Mac. Mm-hmm. And if that thing went down, what would happen? But yeah. the way I've got my backups done and my storage, honestly, I could go, you know, I live 10 minutes from the Apple store. If I had to, I could, I could be up and running pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's, that's like a, a pretty extreme use case and probably not one to like heavily consider, but if you know, like my iMac Pro is a production machine. Like if it goes down, I have problems. And so, yeah. if I had to to get out of a jam, I could work on that Mac Mini uh, to to get something done. So it's nice to have that sort of tether there. So you've had it a few months now. How are you happy with the purchase? I really am. The one thing we did they did and we didn't talk about it, is the cooling is all new in the 2018. My old one, I'd hear the fan. Part of it was that it was old and like the fan was just noisy, but. Even encoding video, I don't really ever hear the Mac Mini. It's really quiet. I feel like it can survive in the entertainment center. You know, it doesn't have great airflow through there, and I feel like it's going to be fine. And yeah, it's yeah. been it's been rock solid for me. And just like the old one, you know, a Mac Mini server is best when you're not thinking about it. And honestly, I haven't thought about it much, so I think it's doing its job pretty well. Yeah, I believe. I think also with that SSD, it's got to be quieter and cooler. Yes, definitely. I had put an SSD in my old one at some point, which made a big difference. But uh, having it just built in from the factory, hey, it's a lot faster. But yeah, it just it just sits there and does its job quietly. And most of the time, I don't think about it, and that, that's how I want it to be. Well, you know, I'm glad we can talk about the Mac Mini again because for a long time I was wondering if if, if it was going to come back or not. It was so sad to talk about it for so long, but yeah. here we are, and it's great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, if you've got a Mac Mini and you're using it in some interesting or fun ways, or maybe you're uh, traveling around to five different work locations uh, and you have your Mac Mini, you know, attached to your chest plate, um, let <laughs> us know. You know, head over to talk.macpowerusers.com and. Let us know how you do. We do. We are going to do a feedback show at some point, so we'd love to hear some interesting uses for the Mac Mini. And you know what? The title sticks. It is the Mighty Mac Mini. You can still do quite a bit with that little piece of hardware. Absolutely. In some ways, it's mightier than ever. Yeah. 
so we're the Mac Power Users. You can find us over on relay.fm slash MPU. Um, you can find Steven over at 512pixels.net. You can find me over at maxsparky.com. Thank you to our sponsors, our friends over at Luna Display, Squarespace, Sanebox, and Omni Group. And we will see you next week. Adios.